And here we go, live from the final night of the Republican National Convention, right now gearing up for the former president's speech in a night and in a moment in politics unlike anything we've seen in recent memory. So I want to show you the stage here, live from the convention floor. This is the lectern there you're looking at for his first speech since the assassination attempt against him. It is his night and it is his stage. It is his party too. The GOP united behind the former president. It is a very different story for the current president right now. He's back home isolating with COVID as our new reporting shows his orbit is now bracing for the possibility he could drop out. One person close to the president telling our team, and I'm quoting here, we are close to the end. And a person who spoke with a senior campaign official saying, I'm quoting, they're finally realizing it's a when, not if. The money is drying up, too. A person with knowledge of the projections saying the campaign is only bringing in a quarter of the big donor money it planned on for this month. And we're also seeing some reports. Top Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, having blunt conversations with the president. Pelosi even telling President Biden he can't win. Former President, four sources briefed on the call telling CNN. The former President Obama also raising concerns about his former VP's future. A source close to President Biden now pushing back hard, saying they are all wrong. Meanwhile, for Mr. Trump, a lot's going right. His supporters are fired up in this moment for what will be an historic moment. He will soon be the first candidate since Richard Nixon to accept the nomination for a third time. And he'll be the first ever to be nominated after being found guilty of a felony. Our team is fanned out across the convention floor and in Washington, D.C. Ryan Noble's on the Hill, Garrett Hake on the floor. Kristen and Chuck are here with me at the booth. But I want to start with Aaron Gilchrist, who's posted up near the White House. Okay, Aaron, dramatic moments here for the Democratic Party, uh, and it feels as though the floodgates have opened now. Talk us through what we know and the defiant posture that the Biden campaign publicly continues to have. Well, Hello, we know that President Biden is, as you noted, back at his home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, uh, convalescing after this COVID-19 diagnosis. His doctor saying today that the president uh, is still showing some of the symptoms, uh, a cough, a runny nose, but that he's doing well, his vitals are normal. Uh, at the same time, we know that there is this swirling cloud of uh, calls for him to potentially step out of the race or step step out away from the uh, the race for president, uh, potentially open the door to somebody else to step into the process to, to earn the nomination. The campaign, though, has very much been leaning into the narrative that we've heard before, that President Biden is and will be the nominee. We heard that from the deputy campaign manager a bit earlier today. President Biden, before he went home uh, to Delaware with COVID, did an interview with Televisa Univision uh, in Las Vegas before he left there, where he was asked about about some of the calls for him to step down. He was asked, how do you feel with so many people who have supported you before now asking you to step away? Do you feel a sense of betrayal? This was in a radio interview. The president talked about his debate performance, saying it was a bad night for him. And then he offered this in re response to that question. Listen. People are now saying, well, that was only one thing, but <clears throat> he's 81 years old. What happened he's 84 years old? <laughs> what happens excuse me, when he's 85 years old? I was smart enough to know, uh, with age comes wisdom. I know the difference between the truth and lies. I know the difference between good and bad. I know the difference between what has to be done. Now, you obviously heard the president coughing in the uh, in the interview he did there. Uh, again, one of the symptoms that his doctor indicated was a, a part of the, what he was experiencing before the COVID-19 diagnosis. At the same time, the campaign's deputy campaign manager said today on television on MSNBC that the president is doing work today, that he's engaged in some official meetings and uh, that he's been making campaign calls as well, Hallie. Aaron Gilchrist live for us there outside the White House. Uh, Aaron. As we look forward here, um, there is this, this question of timing. And if there is, in fact, uh, as we're putting here on a lower third on the bottom of our screen, that we're close to the end of the Biden candidacy, what does that look like? The Democratic National Convention, we're sitting here live in Milwaukee, the Democrats take their turn, and just a month from now, it, that feels like it is in many ways dictating the timeline here. Yeah, I think you're right. The Democratic Convention will start on August 19th. There uh, obviously is this talk about the, the roll call, the nominating process happening uh, around August 1st, sometime before August 7th, potentially. Uh, and, and yet there are still these uh, calls, named people who are standing up and saying the president should step away. And then the whispers from people who are, are only described as sources who are staying, saying that he should uh, should step away as well. At the same time, the campaign points to a list of people who are named who said the president should stay in the race. And
and, and as these calls are happening, as there's talk about President Obama perhaps softening some of his support, Speaker Pelosi, uh, Leader Schumer also referencing uh, some of their concerns over the last couple of days in particular, I do want to note that there's one source that our Mike Memoli spoke to who is close to uh, President Biden who said that, uh, can we all just remember for a minute that these same people who are trying to push Joe Biden out are the same people who literally gave us all Donald Trump. In 2015, Obama, Pelosi, Schumer pushed Biden aside in favor of Hillary. They were wrong then and they're wrong now. So as much as we've been hearing these calls for the president to step away, Hallie, there's at least this one uh, voice that is uh, pretty forcefully saying the support for President Biden is not totally gone. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you. Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill for us, reporting out where the Democratic position is at this point. And some new reporting that a strategist is telling our team that there are a number of black Democrats who think President Biden's candidacy is likely to come to an end, which is so interesting because this is a group that backed him initially in those days post-debate. They have had his back for years, for decades in so many ways, a key part of the Biden coalition. Talk us through the dynamic. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. It would be pretty devastating for President Biden to lose the strong support of black Democrats, particularly the Congressional Black Caucus on Capitol Hill. They were crucial to his nomination in the first place in 2020. They recently threw him a lifeline as a number of Democrats were coming out post-debate asking uh, the president to step aside. Uh, the CBC strongly showed its support for Joe Biden staying in the race, and that temporarily uh, seemed to, you know, keep things going for him. But a Democratic strategist told our colleague Yamish al Sindor that several black Democrats who have spoken with President Biden and his aides in recent days believe his candidacy is not long for this world. And more and more Democrats are calling him to step aside. Uh, black lawmakers have grown increasingly frustrated by this situation. There's a purgatory here that they don't believe is sustainable. Uh, and one way or another, it's got to end because at the moment, there, this intra-party fight between Democrats is blocking out the sun, making it impossible for them to uh, make their case against Donald Trump, which is what they believe they need to be doing. And President Biden's posture has been, uh, again and again, he insists that he is staying in this race, that he's not leaving. But the problem is Democrats aren't really taking no for an answer here. Every time it looks like he stopped the bleeding, more Democrats come out and reopen that wound. Pressure, of course, coming from House and Senate leaders in what feels uh, like it potentially could be something. Uh, we don't know if it was coordinated or not, but the timing does seem interesting. So I hold it over the course of the last 48 hours, like not even 24 hours. We've seen all of these Democrats, Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, either, either publicly or through media leaks uh, coming out and making their points. Yeah, and the fear that these Democrats have is not just that Joe Biden will lose to Donald Trump. That is, to them, a horrific prospect. I'm not trying to downplay how, you know, how much they want to prevent that from happening. But there's a bigger fear, which is that if Joe Biden stays in the race and he ends up dragging down other Democratic candidates in the House and the Senate, then Donald Trump could win with a big uh, trifecta, a Republican trifecta that they believe would be fully submissive to him, given how uh, little opposition he's facing in the Republican Party at this point. That's the other thing that has Democrats freaked out, which is if Biden stays in the race, uh, it could hurt Democrats down the ballot. Let's show some polling in swing states. Um, that showed Senate Democratic candidates currently outperforming Joe Biden. This is, a, this is a, a major point of relief for Democratic candidates in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Joe Biden is tied or trailing Donald Trump while the Democratic candidates are leading their Republican rivals. We see a similar situation going on in Arizona, Nevada, even the red state of Ohio. The Senator Sherrod Brown is ahead of his opponent. The, the fear that Democrats have is that this might not be sustainable, Hallie, even though uh, they hope it will be. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much. I want to uh, go to Garrett Hake now on the convention floor to get the view from the other side of the aisle. Because, Garrett, as Democrats are dealing uh, with this political crisis now for President Biden, it is quite literally a split screen. We saw the president coming off the plane last night after being diagnosed with COVID at the same moment that the convention floor was reaching its peak during the speech of Donald Trump Jr., just ahead of the speech from Senator J.D. Vance. Talk us through the dynamics where you are uh, and the expectation now for maybe which version of Donald Trump we're going to see tonight. Yeah, Hallie, look, Republicans and the folks who've been in this room the last three nights certainly smell blood in the water here. They understand that their party is incredibly united behind Donald Trump. I can tell you the floor just opened right now for the delegates here, and people were running down to secure their seats in the front of this room, like at a rock concert here. There is a lot of energy for the prospect of uh, what Sahil was just describing, basically a Republican uh, wipeout here. I think what you're seeing now is the Trump campaign trying to figure out exactly how to use that energy to their best advantage, and some of that will 
that'll be obviously with their candidate's speech tonight. Now, the Trump uh, campaign advisors have been previewing a speech rewritten by Donald Trump to emphasize unity and to focus at least to some degree on the assassination attempt on Saturday. We have talked often about what unity means to Donald Trump. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to see kind of soaring rhetoric about uniting the country around uh, some big picture concepts. It often means uniting the country around Donald Trump and what Trump believes. I also don't think you're going to see Donald Trump backing away from taking the fight to Joe Biden tonight. The signs that have been distributed on people's chairs right now include fire Joe Biden. And the undercard speakers tonight include both a fake fighter in the pro wrestler Hulk Hogan and the CEO of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. So there's going to be a pugilistic tone to tonight, I think, in addition to the effort to balance that emotion of the kind of emotional hangover from Saturday and the assassination attempt. Garrett Haig, thank you very much. Uh, standing by down there on the on the floor of the convention. I want to come back up here to our booth because I'm joined now by Republican Senator from Oklahoma, Mark Wayne Mullen. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for being with yeah, us here. Appreciate it. So listen, talk us through. Uh, you heard Garrett's reporting there. Right. I think you might have heard it. I did. I heard a little show? bit. Okay, I, I, I was struggling, but I got it. We're talking about, and I just spoke with a, a person who's close to the former president who spent some time with him about how he's doing at this moment, because he right. told a group of uh, Republican attendees here at the convention at a movie screening yesterday that he feels like a moment like this changes him, that it would have to change right. him. Garrett reflected that in his conversation with Eric Trump. You spent time with him yesterday. Right. You've been yes. with him since this. Do you notice a difference between Donald Trump before Saturday versus now? You know, what What I notice is his, his family around him. Uh, I've known uh, President Trump for, for many years, considered him a friend. Uh, I, I, he's always been close with his family in Mar-a-Lago and in Bedminster in private settings. What you're seeing in his family are, is coming around him like I haven't ever seen before. Mm. Uh, for, for President Trump— Which is interesting to me because yeah. we actually haven't physically right. seen some of his family here. Right. Well, they, What's he, that about? Well, because they're, they're, very, they're, they're very private. I mean, they went through a lot, and not all, not all of them uh, want, want the spotlight. But after, uh, you know, last night, their grandfather getting shot at, you know, almost taking their, their, their granddad from them, I think it, it, it was something different. You saw a lot more fight in the family, and the fight meaning— that, listen, he's not in this fight alone. This, this isn't a politician. This is someone's dad. This is someone's grandfather. This is someone's husband. Uh, and and so the family unity is much different. As far as President Trump, he, he is, uh, he is as, as focused as ever, but he is seizing this opportunity to say we need to bring the country together. Mm -hmm. You know, lower the temperature of the political divide and let's put the country first, lead the labels to the side. And, and I think tonight you're going to hear a lot more of that speech about unity. Now, there's a big difference between President Biden and President Trump and their vision and leadership for the country. So you are going to hear that, but not as divisive as it would have been, in the, uh, say, a week from uh, if it would happen a week earlier prior to the assassination attempt. Okay, because, I mean, I've covered the former president for, for a long time, and the right. idea of a Donald Trump pivot became almost a cliche during our time in the White House right. here. Aides would say, it's going to be a different tone, it's going to be a different tone, and then it ultimately wasn't. You're pretty confident it might I'm be very right? confident. Well, listen, to even what Junior said, Donald, uh, Don Jr. said last night, yeah, listen, if you, I mean, he made it very clear. If you, if you think this country can do better, if you think that this country is not where it should be, then we're a party for you. You saw the young man from Harvard, the recent graduate from Harvard that got up and said, I voted for Bernie Sanders uh, in the past. I'm with President Trump now. You're seeing the individuals that may have not have even been politically involved now are coming to the to the Republican Party saying we need a safe place to go. We, we, you have a you have a Democrat Party right now that is starting to say, hey, we got a, a candidate that can't win. So the 14 million people that voted for him in the primary, they didn't know best. But but the, the three of us, Chuck Schumer and, and and Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff is going to make that decision for you. You have a party that's not inclusive to their party base. You're, you got a party that is saying the elite should make the decision. And here we're saying we want everybody to be part of the new America that we're going to make great again. One of the things that's come up here often in my conversations with delegates on the floor, with people like you, members of Congress here, is that assassination attempt against the former president, of course, on Saturday. It is looming over Milwaukee. Right. 
there was that congressional briefing uh, from law enforcement officials. Um, one senator told me he thought it was a, I'm quoting him, a cover your ass moment there. Um, I wonder what questions do you have for the Secret Service? Do you want to see the head of the Secret Service step down? Yeah, you know, I think before we call anybody to step down, you need to know actually what took place. Okay. And, and this is a line of work that I know a little bit about, right? I, I used to do advanced work. I understood what setting up perimeters, the three rings are about, your outside perimeter, your inner perimeter, and then your diamond. And, and there's an AIC that's in charge of every one of these. AIC is an agent in charge. They're the ones that are supposed to be looking at everything in all aspects. When we got the briefing, the briefing was just a timeline of events. But there were some serious questions that did, they didn't even take the time to answer. Like they, what? They, well, for instance, they said they located the building as a point of interest that was outside the, the third perimeter. That third perimeter is usually protected by uniformed local police officers, and it's a soft perimeter. And yet they, they recognize this building as being 150 yards away, a direct line of sight to the podium as a point of interest. So is that point of interest, did you not, did the AIC, did someone make the decision not to, to cover that building? To cover it doesn't mean you got to have somebody on it, but to make sure that that building is protected where nobody can get on it. And then they, they, they said they identified the shooter at 509 as a point of interest. So at 5.09, the shooting took place at 6.11. 62 minutes went by after you saw this person as a point of interest. A point of interest, and, I, and the question was, was why was he a point of interest? He had a backpack and a rangefinder. Why would he have a rangefinder uh, walking around, and did anybody make contact with him? And then 19 minutes before the shooting took place, which was nine minutes before President Trump took okay. the stage, they were actively looking for him, and they couldn't find him. I hear frustration in your voice, and you'll have to forgive me for looking at my phone, because That's literally okay. as you were speaking, um, we got a statement from the Secret Service specifically about the Secret Service director. And the Secret Service spokesperson is telling us, l literally in the last 30 seconds, that Kimberly Cheadle has no intentions to step down. Sure. He goes on to say that she deeply respects members of Congress and is fiercely committed to transparency in leading the Secret Service through the internal investigation and strengthening the agency through lessons learned in these important internal and external reviews. That she's fiercely committed to transparency. Well, Do you I believe that? She is? Well, we'll see. Proof's in the pudding. Okay. So if she's really going to be transparent, we don't have to subpoena her or subpoena the records or the communications between the AIC and the top brass or the, or the, the you know, all the, uh, all the mics should be been recorded. So we ought to be able to hear the communications that was taking place. If she's not going to be transparent with that, then there's a total different prospect that's going forward. But before I start saying that someone needs to lose their job over it, we need, someone does need to lose their job. But who that person is, is at the point of failure. Ultimately, the person at the top of the head is Kimberly. She's the one that's over the, the Secret Service. They were responsible for, for taking care of the whole venue, but that doesn't mean that she was directly involved. And she wasn't directly involved in making decisions, even though I may not agree with, the, with some of her decisions, I'm not gonna <coughs> sit there and say that she needs to go, but, some, but, the, but there needs to be a, a, a change in the Secret Service and the direction they're going. A couple more quick questions for you here. Senator J.D. Vance, obviously on the stage last yes. night. You know he did him. did a great job. Um, he, right. One of the interesting themes last night was foreign policy. Right. You now have two men leading the party who are vocal critics of further aid to Ukraine. You help lead this right. 90 plus billion dollar push to try to get more aid to that country. Are you comfortable with where the party is right yeah, now? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm very comfortable with J.D. Vance, too. J.D. Is a, is, a, is a man who's came up from nothing and has been very successful. He's a man that can show that he can adapt. He's adapted to the fact that one time he wasn't with Trump. And once he actually got to know his policies and understand the man himself, now he's on the ticket with President Trump. You have a guy that also may have not always got the briefings that he needed. Uh, it's one thing to make a decision from the outside looking in, then having a report in front of you and receiving daily briefings and understand the circumstances that's happening on the ground. And not every member of Congress gets those briefings. You've got to be on certain committees to actually have those briefings. I'm confident that when, when, when he's as a vice president, he's getting those briefings, he'll be making the right decisions. Okay. The other thing about uh, Senator J.D. Vance, of course, is that he backs the former president's election fraud lie. You in the House voted to overturn the results of the 2020 right. election. Will you commit now to certifying the results of this election? You know, you have to you have to understand what takes place before you can actually commit to anything. I'm one of these guys that I, I'm, you, I'm very positive. Can I just stop there just for one second? Yeah. Do you worry that that kind of answer inflames so, the rhetoric that everybody's been asking about to tone we, down? You, to, you don't to know what type of election is going to actually take place. I want a fair and balanced election. I want it to be a very fair election that every boy's voice gets heard and we count everybody's vote and let the American people make that decision. And I want them to make that decision. Regardless of the outcome, I want them to make a decision. But for me to sit here and say, I'll guarantee I'll certify them, 
I can't say that until I actually see it. If there was, if it was riddled with fraud, I can't say that I can do that. And we don't know that until after the election. But regardless, if we deem that it's a fair election and that everybody's vote got counted, I will certify whatever those results are. Senator Mullen, thank you very much for your time and for being thank here ahead of a big thank night so at the much. convention. Appreciate it. Appreciate thank it. You. Uh, Kristen and Chuck are with me here in the booth. Thank you both for being here. So some news there with Senator Mullen, of course, as it relates to the Secret Service. Yeah. With that breaking news coming in just in the last couple of minutes, we're going to actually get some reporting from Butler, Pennsylvania, not too long from now. And here's Kimberly Cheadle. There's a, there's a, I'll tell you, there's a woman down there on the convention floor with a sign that says, Fire Cheadle. Mm -hmm. I'm told by her that she was asked to put it away, that the organizers didn't want to see these, like, handmade right. signs on the floor of that, right? Um, but it obviously is an issue for Republicans here, for people, I, th I think, on both sides of the aisle. Folks are fired up about it. Yeah, they are. And I think the calls for her to step down are growing. The senator was very careful not to call for her to That's step right. down, saying, look, I want to get more information. Which, by the way, other senators have called Absolutely. for her to step down. And part of, I think, what has inflamed this situation is a lack of communication. Mm. I just spoke with Senator Warren, and he's incredibly frustrated by that fact. The fact that the Secret Service director in his estimation, has appeared defensive, has pointed the finger mm. at local law enforcement, when ultimately the president's safety and security is the responsibility of the Secret Service. And so I think that there is a general frustration with the way in which she has been communicating information and, and the investigation and the details of that that she's been learning. So we'll have to see if that part of her posture changes. But look, I think the calls for these briefings are only going to continue and the calls for her to resign are like only going to continue to grow louder. I, I'm shocked she's in the job right now. I'll be you honest. Are. I, you are. You, that I, statement I, surprises I, you, that I, she has no intention no, to step it, down. It really does. Okay. And I'm surprised for a lot of reasons, including the atmosphere in the country. Mm. Um, I think the president, meaning President Biden here, made a mistake not firing her immediately. Wow. And I go it this way. And here's what it is. Look, we've all been in these bubbles. Um, Secret Service bubbles, Secret protective Service bubbles, bubbles, sure. Okay. Because um, just to be clear, for, there, for folks who yeah. don't understand, when you travel as part of the protective right. pool with any president, right. uh, three former uh, White House correspondents yes. sitting here, <laughs> you end up in that Secret Service bubble. Yes. So you see right. it. Right. And, and right. look, I want to take you a little bit inside here, because Steve Hayes and I did this on the podcast, and I think it was quite helpful to people. fact of the matter is, there's always holes. Right. In these bubbles, because yeah. we're a free country. Mm. Yeah. Okay? It is impossible. And in, we've all seen it, and when you're in there, you're like, wow, boy, there's, you, you always know there's, there's holes. The problem the Secret Service has, and this is part of the job, which is there's no margin for error. Right. Mm -hmm. that's and right. that's why it's like, you know, what, what looks like terrible missteps in hindsight, at the time you're like, well, geez, we haven't had, we don't, you know, we're going to, all right, well, we're going to have to let that one go. This happens all the time in security. Yeah. And so... I, I think the senator was very thoughtful there. I think he's right. you got to get all the information. I, I don't think she necessarily did anything wrong. I do think her initial sort of defensiveness Response. Yes. created. Yeah. And, 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 yes. but, but at the end of the day, unfortunately, that's just what comes with the job. Yeah. You, and, and the fact that somebody got that close, somebody has to be held accountable. The buck stops at the top. And I think in this political climate considering this is the president's opponent, I, I just wouldn't have hesitated. And I just think it was, I'm, I'm surprised she's still, and it doesn't mean it's her fault, but somebody has to pay the price for, a, for nearly allowing the, a former president of the United right. States to be killed. Particularly when we have learned about this timeline the where they identified him as being suspicious and out and out. To Chuck's point, yes, there are always going to be gaps in the security but the fact that they identified him as right. being suspicious an hour beforehand and allowed trump to take the stage that's a big question and i think they're going to have to be some answers for that and, and accountability I, I just want to with the two of you here and your decades combined of, of expertise <laughs> and sort of political reporting here take a moment to step back for a second mm -hmm. because we're having this conversation about the attempted assassination of a former and potentially future president at the same time that the Republican National Convention is happening, big news in politics any other year, ahead of the Democratic National Convention with the current president of the United States facing calls now privately and publicly from some of the 
the other top Democrats in the country after his decades in office to step down. It is an extraordinary moment in American politics. And Chuck, I wonder if you can put this into some context for us. I've covered a lot of wild stuff, oh. right? And my time is going. Look, this is this is something else. This, I, I, if Aaron Sorkin wrote it as a script, I'd laugh him <laughs> out of the of the room. I'd be it's like, it's not realistic. Stop it. It's no a, one's going to believe it. Season eleven. Right? Yeah. Uh, here we are. Uh, look, and here's what it's done. Six weeks ago. There was half this country didn't want to hear anything more about Trump and Biden mm. literally until about a week before the election. Yeah. yeah. For a variety of reasons, the attempted assassination on Donald Trump and how that might change him. The fact that there could be a new candidate. You're going to have we now have a reengaged American electorate. That throws a lot of things up in the air. Conventional wisdom yeah. gets tossed Com out. At completely. This point. We've upended yeah. the chessboard. Donald Trump's going to actually talk to people tonight that he that would not have normally tuned in to listen to him. Okay pre-assassination. But there's going to be, at a minimum, curiosity to see, well, I'm curious what he has to say now. What's he going to do? I hear that maybe he changed him. And guess what? We're all human beings. Something that tra yeah. traumatic in your life. Uh, it, why? It's very possible that, that there's a different tone and a different everything. So he has an opportunity tonight. He's going to be talking to people that Two weeks ago, had no interest yeah. in hearing him say a word. That's a big deal. And all of a sudden, the Democrats may have a new candidate. That again, voters are going to be like, huh, all right, I'm curious. Let me listen. So we're just in a moment, I think, of a complete re-engagement of the yes. country. Mm. Good, bad, and different for a variety we'll of find reasons. Out. Yeah. And, you know, you know, the worst thing to be right now this week is a pollster. <laughs> there's just too many, you know, you know, this is one of those cases where we're really not going to right. yeah. really understand where the public is yeah. until September. I hear the words of our friend and colleague, Savannah Guthrie, in my ear because she says a lot. you got to have some humility sometimes as yeah. broadcasters and yes. as journalists in a moment like this. We don't know um, what this That's means right. down the That's, road. We don't. And I think the very notion that there could be a mini Democratic primary or that President Biden could pass the torch to his vice president and there could be a new nominee, however it winds up playing out. It's just something that I keep thinking about and pausing to think about against the backdrop of what we're witnessing here, which is this incredibly unified party. And Chuck and I keep thinking, what is Chicago going to look like? Will it feel unified or will it be an open primary, which would be fascinating to cover? It, from a political perspective, but I think it terrifies a lot of Democrats. And I think any way you slice it, there's going to be a very stark difference. There's a ways. weird phenomenon here. Republicans are going to have a hard time breaking through after this week. Right. Mm -hmm. Because all the focus for the next 10 days, and then if there is a new candidate, for the next six weeks is going to be on this. Although new these questions about the assassination attempt, I think, will yeah. still obviously be yeah. pretty newsworthy. No doubt. I mean, look, yeah. we're back. It feels like 20, the 2016 news cycle is back, right? We're Avalanche. getting avalanched and, and the yeah. fire hose of information's coming at people. And what that usually translates into is more engagement. Yeah. And that, yeah. to me, scrambles everything, everything you thought you knew about this election. Throw it away. You can delete all your emails, yeah. you know, because you get to start over. Well, it's important to cover, and it's a privilege to do it with the both of you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Chuck and okay. Kristen. You. Appreciate it. And for all of you, of course, viewing at home, also a privilege. Listen, we've got more coverage coming up here live from Milwaukee, but I want to get to some breaking news that's coming into us right as we were coming on the air. We're learning that Hunter Biden, President Biden's son, of course, is trying to get the conviction in his federal gun case thrown out. Why? Well, his attorneys are pointing to the opinion of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and the subsequent ruling by the judge overseeing Donald Trump's classified documents case that determined the appointment of a special counsel was unconstitutional. And if you're like, well, wait a second, that had to do with Donald Trump. Why are we talking about this in the context of Hunter Biden? Hunter's attorneys say the special counsel who started the prosecution against him then was also appointed unlawfully. Our legal analyst and former U.S. attorney Carol Lamb is joining us now. Does that argument hold water in your view, Carol? Yeah, well, it holds some water, uh, obviously, Howie, because uh, these are two prosecutions that were brought federally both brought by special counsel under the Department of Justice's special counsel regulations. So to the extent that Judge Cannon threw out the case against Donald Trump, it is not surprising that Hunter Biden would say, well, wait a minute, my special counsel, David Weiss, was appointed under the same regulations, and so my case should be thrown out as well. The difference is, uh, there are two differences. One is David Weiss was actually formerly a United States attorney, so he did go through uh, he did go through Senate approval at some stage of, of the proceedings, 
But the real difference here is that uh, Aileen Cannon is a judge in Southern Florida. She's a district court judge. It has Her decision has absolutely no binding effect on a federal judge in Delaware. Not only are their decisions not binding on each other, but they're in different federal circuits. So uh, the Florida case is in the 11th Circuit, the Delaware case is in the 3rd Circuit, and even those appellate courts don't have any precedential binding authority over district courts in other circuits. So there's a long road ahead to seeing whether uh, one district court's opinion in Southern, Cal in Southern Florida is going to help Hunter Biden. Carol Lamb, glad to have you with that uh, developing news. An avalanche of it over the course of the last few hours. Carol, thanks. Coming up, more on that story just coming into us. You heard us talking about it with Senator Mullen, with Chuck, with Kristen, the Secret Service Director, saying she has no intention of stepping down. The latest on the investigation next as we take you back here live to Milwaukee, the Republican National Convention gearing up for the grand finale and that big balloon drop just a couple of hours from now. Stay with us. The Secret Service director in a news statement saying she has no intention of stepping down after that attempted assassination of former President Trump over the weekend. Remember, some lawmakers have said publicly, have said to me that she should resign because of what they see as security failures at the rally. Also today, you've got members of the public honoring the man killed while shielding his family from bullets at that rally. Members of Corey Comparator's family arriving at the visitation ahead of tomorrow's private funeral. I want to go to Shaq Brewster, who's on the ground for us in Pennsylvania. Um, and Shaq, a difficult day for so many in and around the Butler, Pennsylvania community and for the family and friends of Corey Comparator, who I imagine are probably also looking for some accountability here. That's right, Hallie. There's definitely a heaviness here, a sadness as you have people coming out to pay their respects. You, I talked to one person who said he drove more than five hours to come here and be here for this visitation. And Corey is someone who, when you talk to folks, he's going to be remembered as a husband, as a father of two daughters, as someone who was an avid supporter of former President Donald Trump, a volunteer firefighter, a veteran, and someone who was always in church. I spoke to a member of that congregation just a couple of minutes ago, and she told me that, Although she wasn't extremely close with the family, she, they didn't say they were close friends, she knew exactly where Corey sat every Sunday at that church service. She was someone who was welcoming to her. I want you to listen to a little bit of our conversation because she says that the hardest part for her of all of this is hearing people cast doubt on the shooting and that skepticism when she can see the clear pain in this community. Listen here. A lot of... There's a lot of questions that obviously are going to need answered from the events that happened. Um, but people that are saying that the trauma and the realness of this tragic event it isn't real is probably the hardest part because it's very real. It's happening to a family in our community, in our church, and just the realness of it all. The realness of it all, and it's not just Corey who will be laid to rest tomorrow. But remember, Hallie, there are still two people who are in the hospital. Their conditions have now improved. They're now in serious condition from critical condition. But you had one family uh, it's in a statement saying that uh, one of the men who's still in the hospital is suffering from quote life-altering injuries. The impact of this shooting, Hallie, is uh, going to be felt for many for a long time to come. Shaq Brewster, live for us there in Freeport. Thank you. Ken Delanian is joining us now as well. And Ken, I think Shaq has laid out the very human face to this devastating shooting. Um, and, and behind it, these questions of what happened, who failed, where were the missteps, and still too many questions and not enough answers in the eyes of lawmakers that I've been talking to here. You know, Hallie, that was a great reminder that this did have a profound human cost, even if the former president escaped serious harm. And you're absolutely right. There are huge questions. There are differing accounts. There was a briefing of both houses of Congress last night that really sort of raised more questions than it answered because it laid out a timeline where authorities first became aware of uh, the shooter about an hour before the shots were fired and they were looking for him. And then at one point they uh, saw that he had a range finder and yet still they allowed Donald Trump to take the stage knowing that there was a suspicious person with a range finder out there. And then at some point they realized he had a gun and you can see video of 
members of the crowd, increasing amount of video now coming out with members of the crowd screaming, he's got a gun, and you see police approaching. Uh, and they did alert the Secret Service. The question we don't have answered is, what was the elapsed time between the time that local police radioed man with a rifle on the roof and the time those shots were fired? Did the Secret Service have time to pull Donald Trump off the stage? Clearly, the snipers were looking and they didn't find him in time. So those kinds of questions still unanswered. And we have new reporting today that shows that after the shots were fired, the, uh, by many accounts, the Secret Service did not follow their training. They allowed Donald Trump to linger too long, not knowing whether there was a second shooter, and put his life at risk. Uh, and, and it's not how they're trained to do it, Hallie. Ken Delanian, uh, among the folks reporting out this story for us today. Ken, we're glad to have you. Thank you. I know it's been a, a, a very busy week for you as well. Appreciate it. When right. we come back, let's talk about former First Lady Melania Trump. We haven't seen her yet in this convention hall. We expect to see her tonight. But where has she been? What's she been up to? We've got more coming up on her status after the break. We are back here live from the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. The floor is starting to fill up, delegates taking their seats. And through it all this week, you may have noticed that one pretty high-profile person missing from all those Trump family photo ops and festivities, the former first lady, Melania Trump, not by her husband's side, when he made this triumphant entrance into the RNC on night one, his first public appearance on camera since the assassination attempt against him. Now, she is expected to be here tonight. That's after a pretty hit or miss streak on the campaign trail so far, which raises the question, where has Melania Trump been? Here's Kate Snow. Make America great once again. Family and party faithful rallying around former President Donald Trump all week. But one person so far noticeably absent, Melania Trump, staying largely out of the public eye since leaving the White House. Melania was dressed in her kind of D.C. outfit, and when they landed in Florida, she was famously sort of in a caftan, and it was this symbolic moment that people from afar were reading, which was that she was just sort of done with her, pu her public responsibilities. After the assassination attempt on her husband, she did extend sympathy to the family of Corey Comparator, who died, and shared personal thoughts on what could have been, saying, when I watched that violent bullet strike my husband, Donald, I realized my life and Barron's life were on the brink of devastating change. Describing her husband as the generous and caring man who I have been with through the best of times and the worst of times. The couple has certainly seen both. Melania choosing not to appear by her husband's side during his high-profile hush money trial in New York. That is a real choice from her to protect her privacy, to guard herself away from this, what she sees as a toxic political environment. Days later, spotted for the first time, head down, leaving Trump Tower with Barron, designer bags in tow. But she was by his side when he announced his third run for president back in 2022, with the president in January as she delivered the eulogy at her mother's funeral. An irreplaceable treasure. And when the former president cast his primary vote in March, but virtually missing from the campaign trail. Are you going to return to the campaign trail with your husband? Stay tuned. At times, leaving her husband to explain. She's a private person. At the appropriate time, she'll be out there. She's a huge supporter of her husband, but she did not want this spotlight. She did not want this role. Um, and she has always shown a real ambivalence about embracing any elements of the first lady position or the former first lady position. A former model, Melania was often the subject of media attention for what she wore. Most famously, this jacket with the words, I really don't care, do you? Worn during a trip to a migrant child detention center. Melania later telling ABC News it was a message. It was for the people and for the left wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. Melania not on the list of speakers at this year's convention, a break with long-standing tradition, with spouses typically giving a key address, as she did in 2016. Your word is your bond. Giving audiences a sense of deja vu. Your word is your bond. With a speech that sounded remarkably similar to the one Michelle Obama delivered eight years prior. You work hard for what you want in life. life. A staffer for the Trumps later taking responsibility for the plagiarized lines. And in 2020... In my husband, you have a president 
who will not stop fighting for you and your families. Tonight, not speaking, but by his side. Melania shows up when she has to, and not a moment more. And this is one of those moments. And this is one of those moments. Kate Snow is joining us now. Kate, we're so glad to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank sure. you for that reporting. We reached out to the former First Lady's team and haven't heard back, but still um, some question marks about what her role is going to be on the campaign trail moving forward and potentially in the White House if her husband wins again. Yeah, I would say some big question marks. We don't know whether it will look like what it looked like the first term if he is elected, whether it would look the same. I have to say, Callie, he ha she has been doing private fundraisers, right, behind closed doors. So it's not like she does nothing for the campaign. She's been actually to a couple recently, including one uh, for the Log Cabin Republicans, which is a group of conservative Republicans. So she's out there privately. It's just that we don't see her in public. And I also want to flag She's a mom. She has Baron, who is just graduated from high school, Hallie, as you know, and is going to be headed off to college. This is that time in the summer when parents who have a college-bound kid, they know that this is a really busy time. So you, know, you imagine that she's doing a lot of things behind the scenes. I, I was remembering, Hallie, that in 2016, when the Trumps were elected, when she was going to be the first lady, and it was kind of a surprise, right, because we all polling had shown that we thought that maybe Hillary Clinton would win, that night that they won, I I was asked to do a piece about Melania Trump for the next day to explain who she was because she was such an unknown quantity even then wow. because she was so intensely private and still is. Kate Snow, uh, and here we are again eight years later, yeah. Kate. It's just incredible to think right. about sort of the, the history here of the moment. Kate, thank you so much. It's great to see you back home. Thank Appreciate you. it. So listen, like Melania Trump, uh, Mr. Trump's daughter Ivanka and son-in-law Jared Kushner have also been keeping a low profile. We're told that Ivanka Trump will be in attendance last uh, tonight, I should say, but unlike past conventions, she is not expected to speak. So who will be taking the stage today leading up to the former president? You've got fighters like Hulk Hogan. You've got conservative firebrands like former Fox News personality Tucker Carlson. You've got UFC president Dana White, and you've got a musical introduction from Kid Rock, who's been at the forefront of some of the biggest culture war issues over the course of the past year. Vaughn Hilliard is joining us now. Let's start with the family, then we'll get to the celebrities. Talk about Ivanka Trump. Um, obviously, you and I know we covered her on the campaign trail. I covered her in the White House. She was a key part right. of her father's administration, along with her husband, senior advisors. But in 2022, I think it was, or, or after he left the White House, she pulled back. She said she didn't plan to be involved in politics in the future. She wanted to prioritize her family. What is the dynamic at play here if, in fact, there were to be a second Trump term? Right. They went down to Florida. They moved down to Florida. And by all accounts, they are happily down there. There was a question mark of when Donald Trump announced his third bid in November of 2022. Do we see them at that announcement? The answer was no. There was questions once he won the Republican primary. Would we see them out on the campaign trail then once it became clear that it would be a general election rematch against Joe Biden? The answer was no. And upon leaving the administration, again, you noted how they were both playing roles as senior advisors uh, to the very end of the administration. Uh, they they left the White House. Jared Kushner uh, started up this uh, private equity and investment firm, which uh, 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 one contributor of $2 billion from the Saudis. And so by all accounts, it appears that they are continuing to continue to focus on the private ends of this. Of course, they played integral roles in the White House, as you said, uh, trying to help broker Middle East peace deals. And so for the uh, next Trump administration would be Trump administration. It's a question mark. But I have no doubt that uh, you could expect that the door would at least be open if they so desired to go that route. I got a couple more questions for Yvonne. First, let's talk through some of the bigger celebrity names here. I don't want to overread into it, but you've got Dana White, you've got Hulk Hogan. It feels like they are, they're fighters, right? I mean, that is part and parcel of what former President Trump's message has, has been even before the assassination attempt against him. And then you got Kid Rock, who I think people remember that uh, involved with that Budweiser controversy after right. Bud, part, Bud Light partnered with that transgender influencer and Kid Rock kind of famously, uh, famously taking the side of the boycott initially there. Talk us through that. 
Right. I, I think, you know, humans are humans and everybody has their different interests. I think, Hallie, you and I listen to have slightly different music tastes, right? And I think when you look at the lineup here, you have some folks that are going to be listening to Kid Rock, other people that enjoy UFC, other people that enjoy WWE. And then there's other people that enjoy reading books like Hillbilly Elegy. And look, J.D. Vance is an, was the author and rose to national prominence through that route and became Donald Trump's running mate nominee. So, you know, of course, tonight it's not just going to be elected officials coming up to stage but I should also note you have the likes of Franklin Graham the evangelical leader so I think it is a unique lineup that if you told some of the Republicans in this room 10 years ago that a convention would be consisting of Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock and Franklin Graham you'd be wondering who the nominee of your party yeah. is and well I think that man's name is Donald Trump uh, there's also been you and I had a moment the other day with a, a a pretty famous bulldog, and that's not the only bulldog that's been on the convention floor rocking some swag, right? Baby dog, baby dog, the, the dog of Governor Jim Justice, who's yes. running for the U.S. Senate. No, that's not the only dog. And uh, the, the, Hallie, if you may, you can come meet Seidel later. Uh, Seidel, Seidel, Seidel is from... She's from Mission, Texas. Uh, our translator, Albert, here for Seidel. Seidel is, uh, is a delegate this year, right? No, 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 okay. she's not a delegate. She's, no. she's my service dog. I'm a delegate. But she's a uh, two-year-old golden doodle, but this week she identifies as a trumpadoodle. A trumpadoodle, a trumpadoodle. And is this your first time being a delegate? <laughs> yes, it is. Albert, thank you. And to Seidel, we are glad you guys are here with us. Thank you. Here. Appreciate thank it. You. Hallie? Vaughn Hilliard, uh, you are always getting those tough interviews, friend. Appreciate you down there in the Texas delegation. Vaughn, thanks. Coming up, our coverage of the final night of the Republican National Convention continues including a conversation with a member of Mr. Trump's 2020 campaign about what he wants to hear from the former president tonight. We will be back live from Milwaukee in just a sec. So as talks intensify about possibly replacing President Biden at the top of the Democratic quick ticket, there's the ongoing question about who the nominee could be. Now, the vice president, Kamala Harris, would be the obvious pick, perhaps, right? And there is a component of pragmatism in that as well. Election officials say Harris could take over Biden's campaign, President Biden's campaign cash. She is the one who would inherit the war chest. She is the one who would be involved uh, in all of that. There is another question, too, of course. Could there be an open convention? Could it be contested if, in fact, it were not to be Kamala Harris? That's another open discussion inside the Democratic Party. The question is, how would a new nominee shake things up here in this race? <laughs> Who would make Donald Trump more nervous? Mark Lauder is joining us now. And Mark, it's interesting. I just had a conversation with a close ally of the former president, and I asked this question. Um, and we were talking, and I said, you, you know, you got to look at the polling here. Uh, the, the Trump campaign has been pretty clear from their public posturing. It sounds like they'd prefer President Biden to stay in the race. Are you, are they nervous about potentially going up against a Kamala blank, whoever it is, ticket? No, I don't think so, because I don't think the policies change. I mean, the, Joe Biden was the most unpopular president seeking re-election in 70 years prior to the debate. I think it was because of the policy issues, the inflation, the gas prices, the border, the foreign wars. And so because of that, that led them to make the decision to have the early debate. It's not like Kamala Harris or Gretchen Whitmer, Gavin Newsom's going to come out and say, drill, baby, drill, mm. or after three and half years of being the borders are, she's going to want to suddenly do something serious about the border. So I think whatever the Biden policies are, the next Democratic nominee, if there is a Democratic nominee, is still stuck with Biden's policies. Uh, give me a sense. Here we are, night four, I think, night four of the convention. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's been 17 lifetimes. Um, how do you think it's going so far, and what are you looking from the former president tonight? I think it's going really well. I think there's obviously been a huge amount of diversity on this. You kind of have to say that. Don't I you? do have to say that, but I do think, I mean, obviously from an organizational standpoint, I think it looks great. Uh, I think seeing everyone on stage, it's really, I was on a, a, another a network with a former Democratic congresswoman, and she said, every single Democratic voting block is represented on that stage with a message to why that Democratic voting block should vote for Donald Trump. She's like, we need to rethink our convention. Uh. And yet there's been some discussion around the way that the RNC has tried to put speakers on stage to perhaps, for lack of a better word, humanize former President Trump to soften his, you know, in, in the words of some, to soften his rough edges, if you will. We saw that from uh, Kai Tr uh, Trump, Donald Trump Jr.'s daughter, when she came up on stage and talked about her grandfather, trying to talk about Donald Trump as a grandfather. 
all of that is the case. It is also true there has been plenty of rhetoric aimed at the base here. On topics like immigration, we saw those signs that said mass deportations now yesterday. Peter Navarro received one of the biggest ovations of the day here when he came and fired up the base. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. talked about the witch hunt, quote unquote, political persecution, much more common Trump style themes. Uh, it doesn't feel like the RNC has fully shied away from that piece of it. I wonder how you see it. Well, I think you always, I mean, these conventions are always kind of a balancing act. You have to basically throw the red meat to the base. They are the ones in this convention hall. They're the ones that create the energy, do the applause. And so you're definitely, and, and they're out there not in this hall as well. So you'd want to do something there, but you also need to give enough to the swing state voters, the undecided voters. So I think whether it's make America wealthy again, make America safe again, there was discussion about the the border. There was discussion about making things more affordable, and then you add in the red meat, so to speak, for the party faithful, and you, you accomplish both. That's always that balancing act for both parties, I would say. Mark Lauder, thank you very much. Good Appreciate to see you, Hallie. Uh, I'm sure we'll see you 16,000 more times tonight. <laughs> Still to come, we're going to get a vibe check from the convention floor from uh, the vibiest person I know here. Jacob Soboroff will join us in just a sec. We are back now live in Milwaukee, where we are getting closer to the final night of the Republican National Convention, set to kick off in less than an hour. And it is the grand finale. Former President Trump getting ready to get to the stage right behind me here to formally accept the Republican nomination just five days after surviving that assassination attempt against him. I want to bring in NBC's Jacob Soboroff, who's been working the floor. So here, oh, oh, and we've got it. We've got some cheese heads, Jacob. Have you had to, to do, do it. it. Had to do it. Hallie, I've done a lot of serious reporting over the years. This will be the report I'll be known for for the rest of my life. <laughs> Chilling with the cheese heads here in the Wisconsin delegation. <laughs> this, this, this lovely delegate right here, what's your name again? Mary Pat. Told me, and correct me if I'm wrong, the security, the dog and security tried to take your cheese head away? That's correct. <laughs> was it the smell? I think it was like a favorite toy possibility. <laughs> um, this is the state tre uh, treasurer, right, of the great state of Wisconsin. How many times have you been a delegate to the Republican convention? This is my first time. How does it feel to be here? What do you think about what you've heard so far? It's been, a, in all seriousness, the week started off um, horrific and awfully serious, but the tone seems to have lightened, uh, and some of the issues seem to be the ones we're familiar with, right? It, you know, it's really been a great experience. Everybody here is having fun, and it's really kind of brought us all together. I, I, yeah, this is an amazing experience. You were saying to me, that if I put a cheese head on, it might mess up my hair. That's why I don't wear mine all the time. <laughs> Hallie, you know what I'm saying? Let me see. I, I think I have a couple more seconds here. Just want to get these guys in. How you feeling? Fantastic. How can you not? Excellent. Guys, what are the uh, what, what are you wanting to hear tonight uh, from former President Trump as he as he takes the stage? And most importantly, I think, will you be wearing your cheese head when he takes the stage? Oh, absolutely. We're going to represent Wisconsin well. So uh, I think we're just excited to hear uh, how he's he's going to work hard to unify Americans. And I think it's going to be a unifying message. And he's going to talk about all the ways we are going to save America. And, and Hallie, you know, that's that's sort of the name of the game here. A unifying yeah. message. We'll see if it happens <laughs> tonight. Uh, and before I go, I just have to do it. I have to do it. Do it. Do it. I knew it. It's for you, Hallie Jackson. <laughs> it's for you. Honestly, I'm only sad for the uh, can of hair mousse that you have with you at this point, because you're going to have to it's fix that quaff later paste. on. It's a Get it right or pay the price. <laughs> Jacob Soberoff, love it, friend. I'm going to let people take the screen grab here of the, of the thing. Hang on, I'm going to leave it up. Screen grab. Okay. Jacob Soberoff, appreciate uh, your friend. See you downstairs in just a little bit. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage here live from Milwaukee, live from uh, Cheeseheadville coming up right now. Our special coverage of the final night of the Republican <laughs> National Convention continues.
our special coverage of the final night of the Republican National Convention continues right here on NBC News Now. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Hallie Jackson. I'm Tom Yamas, and we're just hours away from the biggest moment of the RNC that's coming up. Former President Trump to step up to the podium to formally accept the GOP nomination for president. Hallie, there's so much to be watching for tonight. Yeah. As we look over at the convention floor here, there's more people than any other night. I noticed that right when at I came in. Hour. The crush that's right. of people that that's are right. here, people in very good spirits. The beers are flowing. They're having a good time. I'll tell you a couple things I'm looking for tonight. Uh, Hulk Hogan, I will not lie. I was a Hulkamaniac as, as a child. You're um, yourself. Not a Kid Rock fan, but I'm sure this crowd is going to love Kid Rock. And then tonight you have the main event, former President Trump. And what is he going to say to the American people? The grand finale. And I will tell you, in my conversations that I've had in just the last couple hours with folks close to him, I've noticed something interesting. We've heard a lot about how this is a unifying speech, but I've also heard from some He's still Donald Trump. He is still going to make the case and prosecute the case against President Biden. Listen, there, there is likely going to be some rhetoric in here, and I don't think people yeah. should be surprised about that. His speech, of course, coming just five days after that assassination attempt against him. This will be the first time that he is set to speak publicly on camera. We saw him a little bit on stage doing a walkthrough, uh, and NBC News can report from a source with direct knowledge of that, that when he came up for that walkthrough, he looked around, and said, they tell me that I'm safer inside. He clearly has safety and the shooting on his mind here, Tom. I spoke with someone uh, that has, has helped work on the speech and the delivery of the speech tonight. They tell me the whole story about him ripping up that other speech and working on this new speech. That's true. That he personally that's, wrote that, it himself? That it's true. I don't know about that much, but I know that... That's they, what a they, source they, familiar they, tells Yeah, they worked on his speech, and I know that by at least this morning, it was not in yet. They were still working kinks out. They were still wow. working on it. So, look, we'll see if he surprises us. He, he's done it before. The tone is what I'm looking for because the tone of this convention has been really different, right? And we'll talk about that more with all of our great panelists. It's a major split-screen moment, though, in the race for the White House, right? President Biden at his home in Delaware, isolating with COVID as his inner circle prepares for the possibility that he could drop out. The walls are closing in on the president as top party leaders privately and publicly plead with him to step aside. While Republicans march on with their convention and crown their leader of the Republican Party and their nominee, Donald Trump. Our Gabe Gutierrez phrased it this way, that President Biden is both literally, literally and figuratively isolated right now. The COVID diagnosis, that diagnosis isolated inside his own party right now with these calls for him to withdraw from the ticket, his defiant posture. But of course, the question is, with the clock ticking now, as we get closer with this Republican convention wrapping up to the Democratic convention beginning, there is an end date to when President Biden would likely need to make this call and when we may see this come to a head, Tom. It's so interesting. Every night when I come out here, I'm like, what am I going to talk to Hallie about? And every night it's been like, we should focus on the convention. Yeah. But the Democrats have been wrestling back the narrative in the worst possible way, though. And that is what is so strange. I will say, uh, we are never at a loss for things to yeah. talk about this week, Tom. That is for sure. It's been extraordinary. Uh, here to preview another jam-packed night, our good friend, NBC News chief political analyst, Chuck Todd. And Chuck, you know, Voters at home, and this is where I'd like to start, yeah. so humor me, voters at home are watching this and they're wondering, wait, if Democrats get rid of President Biden, how does the whole thing work? Um, our crack team yeah. back at, in New York has put together a graphic that, that NBC News Politics put together about how this will work. If he drops out, right, explain right. these steps to us for the, for the voters at home. Well, look, it, first of all, pledge delegates. It's just a pledge. It's the honor system. So even right now, they don't have to vote for Biden, even though they sign a right. pledge saying that they do. It is not binding. That is different than what these guys do. They're actually bound, legally bound on the first ballot. If you tried not to vote for him, you would basically be thrown out. So that is one big difference. So I talked with Elaine K. Mark today. It's going to be for my podcast tomorrow. She's sort of she's on the Rules and Bylaws Committee. She's yeah. written books on how this works. And she said, look, there's a few things you need to know. Number one is there's that. It, a lot of it depends on does he, does he drop out before the convention. Before right. the convention. And if he does, there's going to be a, another roll call. Now, she believes it cannot be a virtual roll call, that that will talk about a insider process, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that you need to see this. She also reminds people those delegates are elected. Yeah. Sometimes they're elected based on directly elected by voters. Some states directly elect. Uh, sometimes they're picked at conventions, but it's all open to the public. These are these anybody as a registered Democrat yeah. could have become one. So you got 4000, you have 4000 of them. The super delegates, she said, it's possible if this is open back up, and this would be a change in the rules that the superdelegates right now are not allowed to vote until the second ballot. Right. 
they could get rid of that and make them also part and of the first ballot. you need 300 delegates to get on the ballot. So you need 300, and you can have no more than 50 from one state, meaning so oh. you can't use like so a... So Newsom can't come in here he can't just weigh in. Okay. Correct, just using one state to do that, which I found interesting. But it's no different than getting on the ballot to yeah, run for right. office. Basically, you got to get petition signatures. It happens to be with the delegates in order to get on that. Realistically... I it's think we're going to say, it's going to be Harris. Yes. Is right? this fanfic? You know, is this it's just most like... likely. Do I think one or two will attempt to circulate delegates to see if they can... I, I think that somebody will try. How do they select the running mate then? How does, does she pick the person or do the delegates pick the running mate? Well, the delegates are going to have to affirm right. whoever it is. But presumably she could decide. It would, it's basically she's going to offer up a nominee is the assumption. And, uh, you know, as much as I think we would enjoy if it were an open race... They don't want that, right? right. They're going to want, they're building an airplane as it's taking off. They're going to want to try to be as clean as possible. So, you know, I, you know, we'll see how all this plays out. But the mo you're not going to have a virtual roll call if he ends up dropping. Chuck Todd, um, while you watch this news, we're also watching the convention just yeah. behind us here. Um, your take on tonight, what, what are you expecting from former President Trump? I, look, I, I have an open mind because we don't, none of us know. Thankfully, none of us have had the near-death experience that he that he had. I think what's fascinating to me is six weeks ago, I would have told you half the country has no interest in hearing what he has to say. Half the country had no interest in hearing what, what the Democratic Party. There were people that are like, I don't want this. We had the lowest rated first debate in the history of presidential debates. Mm -hmm. That's how few people were interested in this race. Yeah. After what happened Saturday? People are going to tune in and listen to him tonight that had said previously they weren't interested. He has a real opportunity. I really think he's going to talk to some voters that he hasn't talked to in a while. Are you, How will he handle it? Are you, How will he use yeah, it? Are you surprised, though, about the tone of this campaign? I mean, because if you think about the lead up into this campaign, about the things that were said about Joe Biden, the things that were said about whatever topic it may be, inflation, immigration. Right. Here we were hearing speeches yesterday about you know, Donald Trump, the grandpa. I, I, it's almost a softening of former President Trump, if you will. I, I thought it was interesting. Mark Roy Mullen told Halle Jackson, I was here for it, said, look, pre-assassination, that is what you, you would have gotten a red meat convention. Yeah. He said everything changed, and it's sort of in that way. I have to say, have you noticed the gold balloons? Yeah. We're going to not just get red, white, and balloons. Gold. Red, white, and blue. We're going to get some gold balloons on him tonight, which... There, some things in Trump don't change. Chuck, go back. Balloons. Your first convention was what year? What, what Mine was, was 92. 92. If, if I would have told you in 92 yeah. that you were going to go to a convention that Hulk Hogan was going to speak at, um, Kid Rock wasn't around yet, but the equivalent of Kid Rock in, in, in the 90s yeah. was going to play here. Uh, it, it's crazy how much politics has changed, how much Donald Trump has changed the game. Well, it's interesting to bring up Hulk Hogan because wrestling really is... Show me shit. Well, it's yeah. more than that, though. Donald Trump, you know, really got close. Back in the uh, in the 90s, um, major venues wouldn't allow wrestling to use their arenas. Madison Square Garden at that time, they were too snobby for, yeah. for wrestling. Atlantic City would. And Trump's, you know, he's, his connection with wrestling he's goes... In the, he's in the Hall of Fame. It goes way back. And his this working class base... Grew up on wrestling. You and I grew up on wrestling. Yeah. We had Dusty Rhodes in the Florida circuit back in the right. day. I might be aging myself a yeah, little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, I remember here. Dusty Rhodes. But we had Dusty Rhodes. We had Blackjack Mulligan. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, those are those are my guys, uh, I'll admit there. But the wrestling connection with him really is an or. That is how he views well, also in the politics. Also right, the, the producing of the event. Correct. The, I, I don't know if you remember 2016, but he came out with fog machines, the walking through, the tunnels. He's been doing it tonight. Out. Every with night. The, with, yeah. the, with the tunnel walk. Yeah. Wrestling's also stuff. fake, but we can... We'll, we'll, we'll leave that conversation. Well, it's not just... It's that, not fake. It's actually athletic. You can no, get beat up for what's interesting day. about the fake is, I believe, you're, you know, I, I actually go through... Remember, he even views relationships with the press yeah. the same way as the wrestling yeah. relationships Gene were with Gene Oakland. me and Gene Okerlund. <laughs> and he would even say to me at You're times... You're blowing my mind right now. Right, no, but I don't actions. mean to do this, but he would sit there and say, well, you know, we're just... This is on brand. You know, we're, yeah. this is good for your... He has always viewed political combat as wrestling. Yeah. So this is not, like, out of the out of the blue for him. Garrett Hake is down on the convention floor. I think he wrestled uh, on He's the... He's loving in, this in combo. The, in the Texas... Uh, Southern Texas so, circuit. I forgot been, what circuit he. Those I are the, the van. On this the, which boys? The van. The van Ryan. Yeah. The van Dykes. Sorry. <laughs> Garrett, uh, talk to us about Guys, what you're reporting. I know you've talked to members of the Trump family, Republicans. What should we expect tonight? 
Look, I've been obsessed with this wrestling analogy, too, because I do think there's going to be this weird rhetorical tightrope that Donald Trump has to walk tonight between the unity pitch that he wants to give and his innate desire to show up like a fighter. And the tell here is Hulk Hogan. It's Dana White, the head of UFC, who's going to introduce Donald Trump. He's going to try to do both things and keep both audiences happy. And I think that's a very difficult thing to do in a speech. And I'll extend the... Uh, I'll extend the wrestling metaphor a little bit further here because what you're going to see from Donald Trump tonight is the reverse of a heel turn. Donald Trump has always liked being the bad guy, the lovable bad guy in wrestling parlance, the heel. He's going to try to turn tonight to be the good guy, to be the grandpa, to be somebody who a wider audience can cheer for. That is a very difficult thing to do in wrestling and a very difficult thing to do in politics. And I think uh, we will see whether he has the uh, dexterity as a performer to pull that off in front of an audience that I agree entirely with Chuck and that the Trump campaign understands is the case is going to be bigger and different than he normally gets. Uh, Garrett, before you go, how unusual is it for the former first lady not to introduce her husband? We know Melania Trump is going to be here, right? She spoke in 2016. It was somewhat controversial because because portions of that speech were lifted from Michelle Obama's speech. But how strange is it for her not to introduce him tonight? We got to say, she has taken sort of a back seat, even though she's done a couple events for the campaign. Look, I mean, Tom, it's un it's unusual in the longer tail historical context where you don't have the, the wife, the first lady out here making the introduction, but not unusual in the terms of this Trump campaign. Melania Trump has been almost entirely absent from this campaign. She's appeared with him, I think, really only at events he has done at Mar-a-Lago. She has not traveled. Neither has Ivanka Trump, by the way, uh, appeared, although she's expected to attend tonight. Um, by all accounts, by all of our reporting, the, the two Two of them were extremely burned out on politics and on the time in the spotlight and in the time in the, frankly, the rhetorical crosshairs of being attacked all the time and that they stepped back from politics. So uh, I don't know if that helps or hurts Trump tonight or if it matters, but uh, yeah, a, a break from long past tradition, but not terribly surprising in the 2024 context of the Trump campaign. All right, Garrett Hake from the convention floor up on his perch tonight. Garrett, always appreciate you stand by for us. Devil without a cause, and I'm back with the beaver hats and Ben Davis slash 30 pack of stroll. 30 pack of uh, no road gain in the pro this is a live look at the convention floor right now with music from Kid Rock, a taste of what's to come later tonight when he performs his song, American Badass, for the crowd. There's going to be some rock and roll here tonight, some wrestlers, Hulk Hogan will be speaking tonight. So we're clearly having a collision of culture and politics here. With that, I want to bring in our political pros tonight. Hogan Gidley, he's a Republican strategist and former White House Deputy Press Secretary for Donald Trump. Trisha McLaughlin, an Ohio Republican communications strategist and former advisor and communications director from Vivek Ramaswamy. And Simone Sanders Townsend, she's the co-host of MSNBC's The Weekend and the former chief spokesperson for Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, I thank you all for being here. Uh, Simone, I want to start with you. Democrats uh, have wrestled the narrative away from Republicans, I think for the time being, until maybe Trump speaks tonight. But it's it's for the worst possible reasons, right? Yeah. The walls are closing in, apparently, on President Biden. Uh, we have reporting at NBC News, so does every other major news organization, that the, the Democrats at the highest level, and I think I think we have a, a full screen we can show our viewers some of the top Democrats who have had conversations or uncertainties about former pre about President Biden's campaign. Here are just some of them right here. And uh, I do want to ask you, Simone, is it not a question of if but when? Mm, Tom, yeah, I mean, I, I keep, Tom, honestly, I vacillate back and forth because honestly, no one knows. I will tell you this from all, I've been on the phone, working the phones all day long. I've talked to my former colleagues in the White House and from the 2020 Biden campaign, folks who work for the president now, I've talked to DNC members, delegates, just voters who are watching this all unfold. And the president is still at this hour, he's resolute is my understanding. He is in this race. Uh, the opposition to the president's candidacy though is also resolute. So this is a standoff and this is a who is going to blink first. And I, it is my gut feeling that the, the as long as the president would like to swim against the tide, he will swim against the tide. But I don't know how long he will be able to swim against the tide, Tom. And if that, when that time, uh, when and if that time comes, I do think we are maybe a little bit closer to when than if. I, I do think that the 
when the president, if, if that time does manifest itself, then President Biden will not only say he is not going to, you know, uh, continue to seek the nomination and uh, seek re-election, I think he would also note, um, deputize, if you will, and, and pass the baton to his vice president, Vice President Kamala Harris, because, you know, she has been literally doing the job. All right, Simone, we thank you for that. Hogan, uh, I'm over to you now. I, I heard you're a huge Kid Rock fan, likely a Hulk Hogan fan. What, what's happened to the Republican Party? I mean, I mean, what, what is this? I mean, is this, is this what the people want? Uh, you give them what they want, and this is exactly what they want. Yes, Hulk Hogan, the lesser of two Hogans, if we're being honest. Oh my God. No, I love Hulk Hogan, big fan. <laughs> and, and, and Kid Rock, I was on the golf course many times with him and Donald Trump, and that's always a scene. Look, I think this goes to show that the, the Republican party is united and now they're trying to expand that tent we talked about this before amber rose on night one the head of the teamsters union hulk hogan kid rock all of these people out there uh, uh, you know black women going on stage saying how much they love donald trump they used to hate him now they love him you're seeing us not just unite around republican ideals and, and, and american uh, first principles but also trying to go outside that tent and you just got done with simone and the left is talking about getting rid of their nominee they're clearly in disarray right now, and I, I got to be clear, clear with you, uh, it's not going to last. They're going to get their act together. We got a long way to go to November, but right now, this is the Republican Party's night, and it has been an outstanding week. And the exclamation point will be Donald Trump Trisha, on that stage. Trisha, there is a, a, a tone shift that I've noticed over the last few days. I, I'm glad you're here because you, you, you work with Vivek Ramaswamy. He came in here, blew the roof off the place. He did throw them red meat. In fact, this whole campaign was a lot of red meat, but that's how he got attention, right? But that tone is now what we're hearing. You know, we, we heard about Trump the grandpa yesterday yes. when uh, G Governor Huckabee Sanders came out here. She talked about how President Trump consoled her when, when members of the media sometimes went too far with her. Why are they trying to soften Donald Trump's image, you think? Well, I mean, I think we do need to get those suburban women back. I think that's one answer why is you do hear people love Donald Trump, but hey, I don't like the mean tweets. I don't like some of the rhetoric. I think tonight is actually, well, it'll be very entertaining with the Hulk Hogan's of the world. I also think it's going to be pretty emotional. Yesterday with Kai Trump, Trump's granddaughter talking about her grandfather. There's kind of a different Trump that they're showing us. I think with Melania being here, even though she's not taking the stage, just her very presence will be emotional. And I, I think it's great that Donald Trump says he's going to meet the moment. He tore up that speech that was going to be going after Biden. And he's saying, we're not just going to be united in the Republican Party, not just the Nikki Haley wing of the party. We're going to be uniting all Americans. But it's not its not a different Trump. It's a different Trump that you guys see in the media and the, and the, and the country sees writ large, in large measure, because Donald Trump doesn't like that side of him to kind of be public. We've had conversations in private all the time about how this is who people need to see, Mr. President. He says, no, I don't want to talk about it. We need to be tough for the American people, etc. What you're seeing now is a recognition that to unite behind him. You've got to see that strength and you'll see it from that debate, uh, from that stage tonight. You'll hear it in that speech, but you're also going to hear kind of a kinder, gentler uh, Trump that many people don't know, but who I know very well because I've seen it. Simone, I want to go back to you. I I'm sure you've read the headlines by now. One of the things President Biden was trying to do this week was wrestle back that narrative, right? To show voters he can do this. Uh, he did an interview. He sat down with BET and he said something that ha that has garnered a lot of headlines. I want to play it for you, and I want you to tell us what you possibly think about what he was trying to say, why this happened, and if the campaign needs to do sort of any kind of cleanup, or if the White House has to do any kind of cleanup. Let's roll that now. I, I found some relief in you saying you're not a political reporter. Think, think about this. There's a lot of really good reporters out there. But they have no limit. I mean, they, they, it's very difficult. The ability to step up and, let me put it, there are no editors anymore. You don't have an editor say, so you can't say that, it's not true. You don't, they don't say that anymore. And so, and what happened, what does concern me the most maybe, is artificial intelligence and how it can be abused. That's why I've been working so hard internationally to try to get an international and the world looking to us what it should be, international standard. I, about, I guess, two months ago now, my staff came to me with a, with a, me doing an interview, speaking. I, Simone, that, that clearly wasn't the right soundbite. We're gonna play the right soundbite. Apologies, here it is right here. Example, look at the heat I'm getting. Because I, I named a, uh, the, uh, 
Secretary of Defense, the black man. I named Katanji Brown. I mean, because of the people I've named. It's about making it clear that American history is black history. Black history is American history, and it's being built by it. That's why we're strong. So he said the black man there, instead of saying Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, Simone, what do you think they have to do? Do they have to clean this up? Should he say something? Well, I, uh, and I, I was trying to listen a hard time. I did think I heard him say, I named Secretary of Defense a black man. I think he didn't say his name. But, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's cleanup to do here. I think the president was literally saying he feels like he's getting heat because of the um, diversity, if you will, and the focus on working class people, diverse folks, making the country, making the, the cabinet and um, the people who make the decisions in the country look like the rest of the country. His focus on working class voters um, as well. So, I, I mean, I, I feel like the campaign got bigger issues, Tom, honestly. Like, there's some other things I think that they are worried about no, in this moment. bigger issues. Simone, I, I get that, but I, and I don't mean to cut you off, but my, my point in playing that was, and actually that other soundbite we rolled, he was talking about the media, and then he, he segued into mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, and it, it was a little bit hard to follow. Now, that one my point is, that he's I'm concerned about that. Yeah. He's trying to, to show America that he can do this job, and he's having these major slip-ups, along with the, the walls of the party crashing down on him. I guess my question to you was that, is this just not working? I think that's a fair question, Tom. I would say, I, I think it is working. Look, I, I remember when I worked for Joe Biden, and everyone used to call him the, the Gaff King in the, in the first presidential election that I worked in 2019, his third, my first for him, 2019, 2020. Um, uh, and so I just, I think that this is normal. I I think what is on normal for Joe Biden, I think what is added on top of it is the age factor and that the president looks old because he is frankly old. And what I had heard from him in the last couple of days, he had kind of taken the age thing on a little bit more head on and talked about the fact that, yes, I'm old, but experience. And that is something that harkened back, I think, to 2019, 2020. The reality of the situation for the president now, though, is, is there is a, there, there are these three different screens people are looking at. They're looking at members of Congress, um, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Hakeem Jeffries, Chuck Schumer, so on and so forth, who are saying, we do, we're looking at polling him. We don't think you could win. And not only can you not win, you're going to drag the rest of us out. Then they're looking at voters. Then you're looking at voters and people who are showing up to these Biden-Harris um, rallies saying, oh, we are with you, Mr. President. We're, we don't understand what folks are talking about. And then you got Joe Biden. That's like, well, I'm hearing the people in the streets, but I'm also seeing what um, Chalk and Nancy, as he would say, and Jeffries are saying to me. So, again, at the end of the day, Joe Biden has said he's in this race. And I think that as long as that's how what he believes, um, that is what it is going to be. He is the only person that can take him out, himself out of the race. I do, though, think that given, the, again, the tide, he is currently swimming against the tide. And I don't know if yeah. he can sustain swimming against the tide for another week and a half. Simone, we thank you for that, guys. I want to bring it back to you. There's a new poll that, that just came out, a CBS poll. Um, I think we have it. If we have it, let's please put it up. It shows uh, Trump up five points nationally. Here it is right here. Um, so I, I do want to ask you, I, I, the, the type is too small there. I guess it's within the margin of error, though. Um, I, I do want to ask you, with these poll numbers, with the hiccups we just saw there, the party walls closed in, Hogan, is it over? Do you think it's over for President Biden? No, it is not over. I know you want to run against President Biden, but do you want to accept the reality oh. it might be over? No, I I'd love to run against President Biden. Kamala Harris is fine, too. Whoever it is, the policies have failed the American people, and we'll make that argument. But the fact is, there are a million lifetimes between now and November, and I've seen this happen too many times because I don't know if you caught it, but I missed that red wave. I, was, I had my surfboard out and everything. Never happened. The fact of the matter on these elections, so much goes into winning and losing elections. Yes, the candidate matters, but the nuts and bolts, the blocking and tackling, the non-sexy stuff like you and Trisha here on TV, it's the behind Behind the scenes, mo voter mobilization, poll watcher, poll worker, uh, uh, you know, all the things you have to do to, to door knock, get people to the polls. And Democrats have a huge advantage on the Republican Party uh, in years past. I think we're catching up to them, and that's good news for the Republicans. But that's all far away from now. We're living in this moment where Republicans haven't seen a two-hour positive news cycle in my lifetime. We've had two weeks of a positive news cycle. It's not going to last forever. Democrats will get their
their act together, and then we're going to have to fight until November. Trisha, how come Republicans, I don't feel like they've leaned into the disarray with the Democrats enough, right? You don't hear, you've been hearing a lot about the Republicans and about Biden, but sort of about this, like, hey, there's no nominee. I, I'm actually surprised that is it because the Republicans want to run against President Biden? Is that who they want to run against? I think there's a little bit of that going on, but I also think when your enemy is, enemy, when your opponent is self-imploding, take a step back and just let it happen. I actually was very impressed with uh, Trump for the past few weeks. He really didn't right. say a whole lot, and he didn't get himself in hot water. That being said, Hogan, you made the point of, is Biden, is it over? I think Biden is here to stay. I feel like we've seen this movie too many times. We get this reporting that, oh, Joe Biden is, you know, he's stepping down. It's going to be Kamala. I think between the delegates and the money, it's just, it, it, he's the nominee. I have no question. I think this bout of COVID comes at a very bad time, especially after Donald Trump is here. He just got shot, and yet he's taking the stage, and then, you know, Joe Biden's going down to COVID. It's not a great juxtaposition for Democrats. Hogan, explain why is Dana White, if I, if, if, if I understand correctly, introducing former President Trump? I, I don't know. In fact, yeah. I'm just kind of figuring and out. And Dana White, for our viewers, is that he runs the UFC, which former President Trump has a very tight relationship with him and, and with Ultimate Fighting. Well, it should be noted, when Donald Trump came into the building e every night, he didn't come up on the main stage. He walked through the crowd exactly like he does at an MMA fight. He loves the way that looks. Look, I, I think Dana and the President have had a good long-standing relationship he appreciates what he's been able to accomplish with the MMA growing it to what it is uh, they're very close friends but also having someone like that who again you said culture clashing with politics here it's important because so many people around this country around the world follow MMA and you have someone who runs that organization coming out and saying I know this man let me tell you something about this man it's just another impactful important moment for this party yeah Trisha what are you looking for tonight this Speech. What do you what do you what do you expect from former President Trump? I think that Dana White is going to say Trump the fighter, and I'm very hopeful that Donald Trump is going to say Donald Trump the unifier, not just for Republicans but for all Americans. Yeah. I think his messaging from the start of this convention has been excellent. He's really set the tone as far as we have turned down the rhetoric. I I think that that's important. It's important not just for uh, the base but for general election voters to see. Yeah. So it's not just it's Donald Trump's party, but. Nikki Haley voters, J.D. Vance, who didn't like Donald Trump in 2016, you're still welcome. This is not a purist test. Come and yeah. vote for Donald yeah. Trump. Hogan, Trisha, Simone, always great talking to you. We're going out to the convention floor. Vaughn Hillier joins us now from down there. Vaughn, you've been talking to some delegates. Uh, talk to me about, about what the scene is like down there and, and, and how it's been and what people are looking forward to. Uh, we just missed, Tom, uh, Richard Petty, the uh, NASCAR driver, of course, who is a North Carolina delegate officially. He just went upstairs. But I was talking to some other delegates here who noted what their anticipation of Donald Trump was tonight, was an arena full of people that are eager to hear the first words of a man who has become the elder statesman of the party, and that is Donald Trump. Uh, and when you're looking at here with the state of the Republican Party, if you will, Tom, it's one that is not fearful of its own shadow at this point. In a way that eight years ago, there were some that were still carefully walking around whether to associate with Donald Trump in this party or not. That's not the case. You saw Ted Cruz, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley up on that stage. And contrast that to this Democratic Party that is questioning where it is, what its footing is, and exactly its best path forward. That is a place here, talking delegate after delegate, Tom, that that is no longer a question mark for this Republican Party. They feel confident with where they stand. And they feel confident with the contrast that of the agenda that they believe a Trump second Trump administration would look like compared to a second administration under Joe Biden. Vaughn, talk to me also. I mean, the, the crowd out here also feels like there's more people. This is obviously the main event, right? Night four. Former President Trump's going to take the stage here. He's going to speak. Um, can you feel that vibe in the room? Say that one more time for me, Tom. I said, I said, I said, there's more people here. It's louder. It's the final night. Can you feel that on the floor, that sort of excitement, electricity? Absolutely. I think especially this weekend, right, when we were flying, all flying to Milwaukee, there were serious question marks about what the atmosphere would be like. Would it be a solemn one? Would it be an angry and frustrated one? All of those are normal human emotions after a shooting, let alone a shooting of the would-be nominee of a political party. And 
I can tell you here that the sense is one of unity and of a sense of pride around Donald Trump as the leader of this party and almost a folk hero type status that he has incurred, not only through four indictments, a financial penalty of $350 million that he and the Trump organization went through, two impeachments during his presidency. Donald Trump and this Republican Party, you could say, have been through a lot. And here they are three months out, and they are looking at a nominee who is head in not only nationally, but in each of the battleground states. And it's a, a recognition that not only the delegation feels about the prospects of winning the White House, but also about taking control of the Senate and maintaining control of the U.S. House. Because you hear publicly from Democrats right now and from our own reporting privately about concerns from the the uh, likes of Chuck Schumer to uh, key Democratic House leadership about what the polling shows right now in terms of the prospects of losing the U.S. Congress. And the folks here understand that they feel comfortable about what the leadership and the direction of this party is. Of course, you don't have Mike Pence here. He was vacationing in Montana this week, right? You don't have Liz Cheney. And there was some trepidation over the last two years about what would losing some of those key figures look like for this Republican Party. And and having the conversations with the delegates that are here that make up the key uh, uh, backbone of the, uh, the Republican Party today, there is none of that concern or trepidation about who they are, what they stand for, and where they believe the trajectory of this party goes from here in a more magnified version of it. And I think that J.D. Vance being named the nominee only furthers the belief that the future of the party will look even more like though it is Donald Trump has effectively crafted for the party over the last eight years. All right, Vaughn Hilliard for us. Vaughn, we appreciate all your reporting. Our coverage of the Republican National Convention just getting started on this Thursday. The crowd waiting for former President Trump to take the stage. But we're also following new reporting on President Biden. Is former President Obama joining the list of allies calling on Biden to drop out of the race? Stay with us. Welcome back to our live coverage here on NBC of the Republican National Convention. This is the final night, night four here in Milwaukee. A lot of excitement there on the floor as the delegates get ready. Everyone looking towards the stage because in a few hours we know the man of the hour here in Milwaukee. Former President Trump is going to take the stage. That speech taking on an added significance because of that assassination attempt. It won't be the first time he speaks to a crowd uh, or an audience post that assassination attempt. He spoke to a, a smaller crowd uh, earlier this week. But it's the first time he speaks directly to the American people. It's the first time he'll address the, the delegation here, all the Republicans in Milwaukee. And we understand, according to him, that he tore up the speech he originally was going to deliver. He called it a humdinger. This new speech, we wonder uh, if it's going to take on a different tone. We saw sort of a different Donald Trump enter on night one here, right? This was just two days after someone almost killed him. He had the bandage on his ear. Uh, something that's sort of uh, become a badge of honor for many people down on the convention floor. They're also wearing a, a fake badge over their ears, a uh, fake bandage over their ears. And, and then when he entered that room that first night, he sort of took it all in. He looked a little humbled by the whole thing. And over the last few nights, we've seen him take in the speeches, laugh at times, cheer at times. Every time he comes in here, the whole place rises to their feet, uh, standing ovations. We're also going to see for the first time at this convention, his wife, the former first lady, Melania Trump. You may remember in 2016, she delivered a speech here. Uh, there, it was controversial because it later was reported portions were lifted from Michelle Obama. She's chosen not to speak this time around. Uh, she's taken sort of a backseat to the campaign. She has made it very clear she doesn't love politics. She doesn't love the limelight. She's focused most of her adult life on, uh, as a wife on raising her son Barron, her and Donald Trump's son Barron, uh, and starting her new life in Mar-a-Lago. When she was in the White House, she did start some initiatives, including Be Best, which was a, a, an anti-bullying campaign, which some people thought was sort of ironic because of the way uh, her husband handles rivals at times with bullying either on Twitter or, or in front of the cameras. Um, we're also going to hear from uh, Hulk Hogan tonight, which is quite different. He'll be addressing the convention floor, and Dana White will be address, uh, introducing the former president. He is the uh, head of the UFC, which former President Trump has had a very, very close relationship with the UFC. As we look at a, a countdown clock here in Milwaukee, 
uh, getting things started for tonight. A lot of action, a lot of excitement here as people wonder what will former President Trump say today? What will he say to the American people? We heard Senator J.D. Vance yesterday talk about uh, sort of his life story and his vision for the future. It was his introduction to America in a lot of ways. He leaned into his working class roots, right? Growing up in Appalachia, growing up in Ohio, talking about how those formative years made him who he is and, and, and really shaped the way he saw America and the policies he wants to put forth as a potential vice president. When I was speaking to delegates afterwards, they told me that one part of the speech they really cared for was when he talked about that he's going to be the vice president for everyday Americans in every corner of this uh, country, not only in those battleground states, those Midwest states, but really all over the country. Um, he also spoke about his mother and, and, and highlighted how she had overcome addiction, hi highlighted how she had overcome hardships in her life. Uh, it was an emotional moment in the speech where his mom started crying at one point, uh, which, which was somewhat funny that the entire convention hall started chanting J.D.'s mom, J.D.'s Katie's mom, uh, which might be a first for, for conventions in, in America. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, there have been people that have come out to this convention and they have blown the roof off the place. People like Peter Navarro, people like Vivek Ramaswamy that we're going to hear from in, in just moments. He's going to join us live on set. Senator J.D. Vance's speech was a little bit more subdued. Uh, it was a little different. His tone was a little different. That, that, that may have been the plan, right? Because if you're looking at former President Trump and you're considering him and you're considering him, you're wondering, you know, so is he stable? Will he be in control? And then you look at someone like Senator J.D. Vance and maybe what the message they wanted to come across is that he's a little different than Trump, right? He may, he may share the same ideas, the same philosophies on government. That being said, he's not the exact same man. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to have Vivek Ramaswamy come up uh, in just moments. We're going to take a quick break. Right after this, his take on his friend J.D. Vance's speech, what he thinks about former President Trump's speech, what we can expect, and his future in politics. Stay right with us. Our message to every legal immigrant in this country is this. You're like my parents. You deserve the opportunity to secure a better life for your children in America. But our message to illegal immigrants is also this. We will return you to your country of origin. Not because you're all bad people, but because you broke the law. And the United States of America was founded on the rule of law. That was a clip of former Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy delivering a fiery speech here at the RNC and receiving a huge response from the crowd. Vivek is now here. He joins us live in our booth at the convention. Vivek, so this was your first Republican National Convention. You blew the roof off this place. What was that feeling like? Look, it was gratifying. These are people who, in some sense, I've been talking to for the last year and a half with a message of national unity, but of a different kind. Not fake artificial national unity but a true national unity that says, we're gonna disagree deeply, not a little bit, but deeply about a lot of things, but we are still bound by a common set of ideals. So I tried my best to transmit that. I did get a little passionate with that message, but it was really gratifying to see the crowd respond to it. And we'll go into those immigration policies in a moment. Your, your friend, Senator J.D. Vance, yes. delivered his speech yesterday. Um, it was different than your speech. It was yeah. different than Peter Navarro's speech, right? It wasn't all that red meat. It was very biographical. Uh, he didn't blow the roof off the place. People loved the speech. Maybe in a different way. Uh, how do you think Which he did? I thought he did outstandingly well. I mean, it was a different context yeah. as well, right? And I think JD's, this is JD's introduction to the country. I thought he hit it out of the park. I come from a biased perspective. Yeah. JD's a good friend. Usha, his wife, I thought did outstandingly as well. She's also a friend and a right. former classmate. You guys classmate. all met in law school, right? We were all classmates in law school. And I was glad that the country got to see a side of him that's very hard for it to come out on that stage. He, Give a nice long speech, and I think that that was good to be able to see the contours of a personality that's hard to otherwise come across on a stage. You know, it's interesting you bring that up, right? I know you're an Eminem fan, right? Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, will the real JD stand up? And what I mean by that is that we, we heard from the guy yesterday, right? He's deeply intellectual. He wrote a bestseller about his life. Uh, incredibly educated, a veteran. 
But you watch him in interviews, and 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 he can sort of lean into like the the red meat of the party. He can throw that to those viewers, whether they be in you know podcasts or, or right wing talk shows. He's also a phenomenal debater. But the guy we saw yesterday, that wasn't the same guy. And you, you're saying he has different sides. You think that was part of the goal yesterday? I mean, I understand every American you know, watching our exchange even now. Everyone has different sides of their person. The question is what actually comes through in what context. I got this question a lot during my presidential campaign as well. If you're sitting down in a two-hour podcast, it's a different experience than if you have a 30-second clip that's either on a debate stage or a two-minute hit on a cable news network. And so I think you want a president who has the full octaves, right? Yeah. That's that was my approach running for president. I think you want that in a vice president as well. So yeah. that's what I would say. You've chosen to go full Red Bull a lot in, in your political speeches. Uh, energy, passion. What do you hope to hear from former President Trump? Now look, I... I, I I think that part of the issue is not everyone sees everything, right? I yeah. think there have been settings where I've also given speeches like that are right now, and far right more now. emotional. Yeah. Exactly. So I think today for Donald Trump is a different context where he's coming off of a historic event for the country, not in the best of ways last Saturday, that literally touched him in a most personal of ways. It was a near tragedy for his family, for him, and most importantly for the country. And how could that not affect you? So I do think that he has rethought what would have been his otherwise approach. How could it not? And I hope the country has a chance to see the man I know who, yes, cares about our own agenda, but also cares about uniting this country through that agenda. And I hope that's what we see tonight. Do you think it's going to be a, a, a speech that will surprise people, or do you think it'll be a speech that is classic Donald Trump? I think it won't surprise those of us who know him well. That much I will say. Those of us who know him well know that other side of him. I think it's going to be the kind of speech, though, where I hope people around the country are saying, hey, that was a side of Donald Trump that I didn't know existed. It's not that he pivoted. It's not that he switched. But he's able to put a spotlight on a different side of someone who he's always been. That's what I hope happens and I expect is going to happen tonight. I, I do want to ask you, um, you, you've obviously risen up the ranks through politics. You've gotten to know former President Trump after the primaries. What did you learn about him? What, was, what surprised you? One of the things that surprised me, I've known him for a couple of years, but I really only got to know him well after the primary ended. His intellectual curiosity, actually. His interest in learning about issues that weren't necessarily the issues that he was focused on is something that didn't come across in the either media or public appearance version of Donald Trump that were served up. He's an actually intellectually curious man, and he and I have had very good conversations about some non-traditional issues. Central bank digital currencies, the future of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, thinking about even the future of AI. This is a man who, despite being not that much younger than Joe Biden, I think he has a much younger spirit than somebody who's ordinarily as advanced in age. Let's talk about immigration. We bumped in with that sound you talking about immigration. Explain to me your, your view on birthright citizenship. I know yeah. your parents were immigrants. My parents are immigrants as well. We were born here. We became yeah. citizens. But you want to make sure that, that that law doesn't stay exactly the way it's written in the Constitution. Walk me through it. Well, to be clear, respectfully, I actually want to follow the Constitution. Yeah. The Constitution, 14th Amendment, Section 1, right. says no, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. Right. So historically, that has always been interpreted to yeah. say a kid of a diplomat who's here legally does not enjoy birthright citizenship. Mm -hmm. And my view is the kid of somebody who's here illegally doesn't enjoy birthright citizenship either. So it's one thing if your parents or mine who are here yeah. legally, came through the legally blessed process subject to the jurisdiction, yes, that applies. However, somebody who entered this country illegally, say there's soldiers who invade through the southern border, nobody in the world thinks that that person enjoys birthright right. citizenship. So that's the point I've made. And I do think that that is an interpretation of the Constitution that the current Supreme Court shares. Yeah. And that's important. I know you're a student of history. Do you believe in asylum claims? And where do you draw the line on asylum claims? I mean, do you believe in asylum claims? The law allows for asylum claims. But I think we need to have proof of asylum proof of the case for asylum, and that's what's missing today. Right now, if you cross the southern border, you just check a little box, say you seek asylum, and they automatically treat you as though you are entitled to it. Does asylum only... Need to, yeah. Proof of asylum is a basic principle that everybody should agree on. But, but does it extend to, let's say, crime? Does it extend to politics? Does it extend to the economy? Can you have asylum claims when it comes to any of those things, or do you have to simply be sort of an, uh, uh, seeking asylum because you're relieving political oppression? 
it walk has me through to be, a little bit. It, I believe it has to be yeah. a direct threat to that individual. That can be provable. A, that can be provable with a high burden of proof, with a high degree of personal consequence. That would bring down the scope of asylum claims, I believe, by over 95% relative to what they are today. You have a passion for this. Would you take a job in the administration? As it's getting loud out here. Yeah. Would you take a job to lead Homeland Security since you're passionate about this issue? So President Trump and I have had some great conversations about both impactful roles, major impactful roles in the administration. Obviously, there's also been some recent developments this week, right, yeah. with J.D., my yeah. friend, but also fellow Iowa. I want to ask you about that as well. So, so I would see multiple different paths open coming out of this convention. I expect to have some good conversations with President Trump. I'm keeping a very open mind, but what President Trump and I agree on is whatever it is, it's going to be large impact on the country, and that's what I'm rooting but for. But if you could write your own ticket, would you rather a, a role in the administration or you want to serve the people of Ohio? Look, I, I, I want to serve the people of Ohio, and I want to serve the people of this country in the process. Of course, a senator represents the country, but is representing a state in the Senate. So look, I think there's multiple paths. One of my core passions, in addition to the immigration issue, is shutting down the regulatory state and the administrative state. It's one of the core issues of my presidential campaign. There's room to do that through the executive branch. There's also more of a foundation that needs to be laid through the legislative branch. Yeah. So both of those are important. And I'm giving thought to that. Obviously, this has been a crazy week. My first thought hasn't been what's next for me. It's yeah. been what do I care about for the country. I know you're a tennis player. Soon. And yeah. one of your favorite players, I think, is Rafael Nadal, right? He's oh, a, yeah. a true grinder, right? Yes, he plays he is. for every point, practices a lot. Yes. I know you're a firm believer in, in sort of the theory of reps. you got to really put the time in. Yeah. People like you, people like Senator J.D. Vance, have an interesting path to politics, right? Yeah. It's not the normal path. You didn't start at the city council. You didn't work your way up to the state house. No. You kind of exploded onto the scene, yeah. right? Do you think that's better? Because I ask, because if you were to become a senator, yeah. you'd have zero experience in the Senate. And that's a knock that a lot of Republicans had on Barack Obama when he got to the Senate. How is it different this time around? Well, look, I think it's been an asset for J.D. to be bring a fresh perspective. And I think it would be an asset for me, whether it was in the Senate or in the administration. I do think it's a good culture in our country to have people who are outside of politics, not everybody in politics, but a good number of people who do come from outside of politics. It's a tradition that our founding fathers would be proud of. Our founders were not professional politicians either. One of the things I love about J.D. is he brings in energy, but also a coherent ideology. Even though mine's not exactly the same as his in every respect, life would be boring if it were. I think we need more people in politics from the next generation who have their own vision for the country. Governor so DeWine right. was sitting right here yesterday. I asked him about yeah. you. You wouldn't commit to anybody. He says it hasn't happened yet. The process is still fresh. What's your pitch to Governor DeWine to say, I'd be, I'd be a great candidate. Can you think about me? I'm not in the business of making that pitch. What I've said is if I'm asked to serve, I would have to consider it. I have an obligation to this country to consider it, but to compare that to the other path of driving major change at a high but level why would you be a good through the executive think? branch. Look, I, I care about this country. I've lived the American dream, and I want to translate that. I'm not in this for any other reason than to give back to the country. And I also do have a very clear vision for what I stand for. It's not the same as what everyone else in the Senate would agree with. I think the top threat to the country is the overgrowth of the regulatory state. I'd be a clear voice for shutting down much of that administrative state. And I think it's good to have senators who have clear, identifiable ideologies and views so we can have a high-quality kind of debate that everyone may not agree, but the ability to engage in that friendly and respectful debate is something that I think we need more of in politics. Would you guys rather run against President Biden or Vice President Kamala Harris? <laughs> I think, I think there's pros and cons to both. I have a feeling it may not be either. It was actually in the NBC Republican debate at the end of it in my closing statement last year that I said that Biden wouldn't be the nominee. It was dismissed by a lot of people as crazy talk at the time. It looks like it's on, on the verge of actually happening. We're going to have to wait and see Vivek Ramaswamy. Thanks for taking Thank time. Thanks for talking. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And our coverage of the Republican National Convention continues as night four gets underway. New reporting about President Biden, his inner circle bracing for the possibility that he could step aside. Hallie Jackson is going to join us back live. We are live in Milwaukee. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are live tonight from the fourth and final night of the Republican National Convention. Hallie Jackson just back from the convention floor explaining the energy down there right now. You saw it up close. It's big. It's the final night. People are excited. People are dressed to the nines. They are maxed out. But I will tell you, there's a lot of conversations. I was just down in the Michigan delegation talking with the top official there. Question came up, of course, what do Democrats do next, Tom? This has been one of the driving storylines, of course, with Democrats in political crisis right now, as we've been talking about all hour. We do expect, though, here in Milwaukee, former President 
President Trump to take the stage in just a few hours from now, looking at the clock. He will close out the convention and officially accept the nomination for the third time in his political career. Now, sources say that his speech will have a unity focus, but I'm also told that Donald Trump will still be Donald Trump. Expect him to draw contrast with the Biden administration. Meanwhile, President Biden is recovering from COVID-19, while some of his closest allies, including former President Obama, are reportedly joining the calls for him to step aside. For more analysis on the convention and the latest reporting on President Biden's candidacy, I'm joined now by GOP strategist Matt Mowers and Axios national political correspondent Alex Thompson, who covers President Biden extensively. He's broken a lot of news about the recent developments. Alex, I want to start with you. I'm going to put a graphic up for our viewers now. These are some, uh, uh, I would say, the highest levels of the Democratic Party, right? Uh, this is your story, or a story on Axios. Uh, but the, the graphic I'm talking about is basically former President Obama, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Representative Adam Schiff, the, the top players, here we go. Uh, reporting from news organizations all across the country, these, these three really aren't with him right now. What more can you add to that? Yeah, so Joe Biden is taking this weekend, the seclusion in Rehoboth, Delaware, while he has COVID-19, to think about his future. And, you know, the, there, there are multiple minds. There's divisions within the Biden world over what to do next. Now, there are some people that still see a path forward, that he is the Democratic nominee, that there is more risky to put the nomination in someone else's hands than his. And it's also, he does not want to necessarily step back and then go and then sit back on election night and see Donald Trump win anyway and think, I didn't do everything I could. On the other side, there are some people that think this is untenable. Beyond the Obama stuff, Nancy Pelosi, donors drying up, like they could end up having a budget crisis just in a month here if they do not figure out how to turn around the ship. So the next week and a half are incredibly critical to his political future and the Democratic Party's future. Alex, based on your reporting, where is Jill Biden on this? Jill Biden? I mean, Jill Biden was one of the ones that really wanted to run in 2020. She's one of the ones that really wanted to run it in 2024. And you saw after that disastrous debate performance how she sort of took the wheel. And it, you know, she, in her past, she was a reluctant political spouse. She's become an incredibly enthusiastic political spouse in this moment. She wants to keep going. Matt, I want to bring you to the conversation here. It's interesting. We've been hearing a little bit about this at the convention, but we haven't been hearing a whole lot. You would think sometimes, you know, former President Trump would lean into his uh, his opponent's bad news or misfortunes, and he's not. Do, do Republicans want to run against President Biden? One that they know will not be successful, which is having Joe Biden. One that will be unlikely to be successful, which is replacing with Kamala Harris, who consistently has had actually lower favorable ratings than President Biden even has. And anytime she's been to spotlight, whether it was the time when she was asked to handle root causes of migration, and you know, most Americans obviously radically disapprove of the Biden-Harris administration's handling of immigration to a whole host of other issues. You see the American people say thanks, but no thanks. There are, there are polls that show though Kamala beating former President Trump though too. Yeah, well, most uh, that, uh, very few and far between. Yeah. Most there was a new round of polling out today that showed Kamala Harris was actually underperforming even Joe Biden right now in a number of states. Um, the one thing she does do, I believe, is actually resets a little bit of the Democrat coalition. I mean, President Trump is performing. Uh, historically well for a Republican candidate with African-American voters, with young voters, even, um, you know, with Hispanic voters, many polls showing me actually winning an outright majority against Joe Biden. I do think that uh, Kamala Harris maybe reset some of that traditional Democrat coalition, but I think her ability to win over voters in the middle, a lot of suburban voters that are maybe repelled by both Biden and Trump, is going to be very challenging. Keep in mind for both of you, the one thing the vice president has done is take the lead on the issue of abortion access, which we know is going to be critical, especially in the eyes of Democrats come November. Haven't heard much about that at all here up on stage, yeah. other than, of course, the Republican platform that for the first time in decades does not include calls for a strict federal ban. Right. I mean, to both of you here, and Alex, I'll start with you, uh, how do you see the reporting around this if the vice president were to take the top of the ticket here? She's obviously got um, got some juice when it comes to that issue. Yeah, and in, in, in a way that Joe Biden does not, because Joe Biden doesn't even like saying the word. I still remember in the State of the Union, the word abortion was in the prepared remarks. He didn't say it when it came in the teleprompter. She has been all in on this issue, but it is the issue, even more so than democracy, which Joe Biden really leans into, definitely the issue that Democrats
Democrats win the most time. Well, look, I, I think Donald Trump did in some ways defend that issue. I mean, and that's the, there was not by accident that you saw him, you know, say, you know, turn it, turn the page on Project 2025. It's not his project, not his deal. But does J.D. Vance's said, appearance on the ticket refang the issue, so to speak, I, I don't, given I don't his think, position? I don't think it does, because even if you look at some of the interviews he was doing last week, he was aligning himself with Donald Trump's position on abortion right now. And now it's the National Party platform, and it actually gives uh, J.D. Vance something that he can say, look, this is the Republican Party that I was nominated by says, that's what I believe as well. Alex, we have about 30 seconds. Do you think President Biden stays the nominee? I think it's completely 50-50. And it's, I still think it's 50-50. I still think it's 50-50, and it's a completely singular decision. The fact is, like, in some ways, the, Ob the, the Obama stuff actually makes him more likely to stay in, because Obama tried to convince him to get out in 2016. As one person close to Biden put it, you only get one chip. You only get one chance to do that. A very difficult and complicated relationship between those two former running mates. That's going to do it for this hour of our special coverage of the RNC. I'm Hallie Jackson. I'm Tom Yama. Stay with us. More of this historic night just ahead. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.